Hi guys, welcome to the Hiatus Tequila's Tequila Types and Production Methodology Masterclass hosted by Hiatus Tequila. My name is Garrett Dostal, the brand ambassador for Hiatus Tequila, and I've been working for the company for about a year, almost to the date as of now, and I'm very proud to be joining such a small and wonderful team. Um, you may or may not have heard of Hiatus Tequila. It's a newer brand, uh, but we're excited and we come from good purity of standing, so hopefully you'll enjoy our presentation and learn a little bit about us and about tequila in general. Um, there is a slight delay between the actual live stream and myself, so I will not be able to follow along in the live chat. I do apologize, um, but we hope you enjoy the education session nonetheless. So please bear with me. Give me a couple seconds. I'm going to calibrate a couple last things, and then we'll get started, okay? Cheers. All right, guys, it looks like we're all good on our end. Um, I'm looking at the YouTube live stream feed right now, and it looks like the internet is very taxed. There's a lot of people online, so YouTube's limiting bandwidth. So I hope that the presentation goes flawlessly. Uh, if not, there will be a live recording hosted after, me, after the show is, uh, takes place uh, that you can find on YouTube itself, or we'll be probably reposting in the future a more condensed, concise version, probably without the live video recording. Uh, but in the meantime, please uh, join us and let us uh, start learning a little bit about tequila. All right, my friends, so the reason why we're all here, uh, masterclass on types of tequila and production methodology. Uh, here on the left, uh, you'll be able to see a quick little guideline that lists all the different items that we'll be covering today, just so you can kind of know where we're at in case you need to pop in or pop off of the stream itself. Um, so uh, just so you can pop in or pop off of the stream itself, um, but it'll kind of uh, follow along that kind of guideline. All right, my friends, um, thank you for joining us. But before we start the actual class, please let me just have one minute to kind of talk about who we are and what we do. So like I said, my name is Garrett Dostal and I'm the tequila brand ambassador for Hiatus Tequila. Hiatus Tequila has only been around for a year and four months at this point, uh, launched last year, and it's been doing wonderful ever since. It's only in a couple markets, uh, New York, Florida, Missouri, and soon to be Indiana. Um, so it's a great little brand. Um, it went to the International Spirits Festival in San Francisco and it got a silver on the Blanco, as well as on the Añejo, and a gold on the Reposado. We're very proud of that. Uh, last year, we also submitted the uh, Añejo to Wine Enthusiast, and Wine Enthusiast rated it a 95 points by their standards, which is great. Uh, it's one of the highest awards they've given in tequila. And because of that, last year, we were lucky enough to be chosen as one of the top 100 spirits of the year. So we're very proud of that. Um, we also got other awards, uh, such as Esquire Magazine um, rated us top 29 spirits of the year, and Maxim Magazine Sorry, Maxim Magazine rated us top 29 spirits of the year, and Esquire Magazine rated us one of the top 10 uh, tequilas to have for a margarita. So we've got some great rewards under our belt. Uh, we're very proud of who we are. Um, we come from the essence of purity of fruits. So our founder, Christopher DeSoto, uh, who spent a lot of his time in his uh, young in life, uh, went between Mexico and Texas. And while he was there, um, because his family did business back and forth, uh, he tasted true tequila. And all the tequila that they brought back with them to America was all small batch regional tequila. And so he was drinking, you know, the really good local stuff, the stuff that we don't necessarily get across the border. Um, there's tons of brands in Mexico that never quite see it across that magical divide. And that's kind of created what we call the American market versus the Mexican market, where there's tequila specifically crafted, created and curated for the American palate. And that's one of the things that he seemed to learn when he came to America and he tasted tequila for the first time in our side is that tequila doesn't taste like tequila like it does in Mexico, or at least in his perspective. Uh, he grew up in Mazatlan, and um, he was drinking that kind of regional tequila. And everything he tasted here was either too sweet or it had artificial additives or those kind of things. And it really affected his flavor profile, and it re didn't remind him of home or what he knew as tequila. So eventually he got tired of working for the big companies he was working for, and he decided to set down. And when he set down, he uh, decided to make a tequila because it's something he's passionate about, something he loves, something he cares, and it's kind of a through line in his life, something he's always been with him. So he chose to make a tequila that really highlights the Mexican mentality, spirit, and essence, that really tastes like a Mexican product. Um, the one thing he didn't want to do, though, is he didn't want to have a bottle that was covered in Mexican modality, you know, images and symbology that represented Mexico, because here in the United States, 
we have all these bottles that are covered in skeletons or covered in mariachi bands, but it doesn't really speak to the nature of the product. The product inside the bottle tends to taste more of an American tequila, where it has that astringent, like, burn, or it kind of has that fingernail polish remover quality to it. I'm not saying they all do, but it's a lot of them that do. That's very harsh and stringent. Almost tastes more like the byproduct of distilling as opposed to the pure distilling distillate. Um, which is the beautiful sweet tequila that we know down in Mexico. So he wanted to create a Mexican tequila, but put it in a more Americanized bottle. And that's where we came up with this beautiful clean design um, of the highest tequila bottle. It speaks to itself. It's cleanliness, it's purity of fruits. We're 100% blue agave, no additives across the board, fully sustainable. Um, meaning that uh, our agave, once they're harvested, the fibers and such go back into fertilizer, back into soil, or they're sold or used by another company for paper or products. Uh, nothing goes to waste. Um, trying to mitigate our footprints because we really do care about the environment as well as tequila. Um, but it's a very clean, pure fruit, um, very beautiful tequila, and you really taste the essence of what a true tequila is with it. Now, on that note, thank you for letting me do my little spiel. Let's, uh, let's get into why we're actually here today. So we're here today to talk about tequila. More specifically, we're gonna narrow the broad category of tequila down to the types and the production methodology behind it. So all tequila, for the most part, follows one production methodology with multiple different branches. And there's a couple different types that most people tend not to know about. And that's what we wanna kinda of hit the head on here, is that when you look at Mexico, this is Mexico, it's a beautiful Mexico, it's in a, the highest tequila shades, please forgive me, there's nothing wrong with it, we just wanted to give you a nice little shadowed outline of Mexico. Um, most people think of tequila tied to Mexico. First thing you think of tequila is you think of Cinco de Mayo or you think of Mexico, at least if you're here in the United States. Um, but the one thing that you don't really think of is you don't think of all the stuff that comes along with it. So tequila is not just a product on its own. Give me one second, my friends. Sorry about that, my phone was still on. Um, so uh, you don't think of everything that comes with tequila. You know tequila is kind of a, a concept or a broad category. But in reality, when Mexico, there's a lot of different spirits that come out of Mexico. You have tequila, you have mezcal, you have sotal, you have charranda, you have bacanora, you have raicilla. You have a lot of different products. And a lot of these are made with agave. And there's only small differences between them and tequila itself. And for a lot of people, that's kind of confusing. Or for a lot of people, they don't really understand that or know that even, that there are these other alternatives that are also made with agave. They think of tequila as the agave spirits, when in reality, there are multiple. And tequila specifically can only be produced in five specific regions. Um, as shown here on the map, uh, Nayarit, Jalisco, Michoacan, Guanajuato, and uh, Tamilupas. Um, all great production regions, um, but tequila is not made all over Mexico. It's another common misconception. And when people think of tequila, they think of all of Mexico, when in reality it's very specific regions inside of Mexico that are actually permitted to make the product. Um, reason being is that tequila is actually a controlled product, and most people don't seem to realize that or know that, that in tequila, that tequila has, it's more like champagne, where it has specific qualifications that allow it to be what it is, that define it. And in Mexico, there's a specific terminology for this. In the United States, we don't really have an equivalent. Um, the closest thing we would have to would be kind of like a trademark. But in Mexico, it would be something called the appellation of origin. An appellation of origin does a couple things. One, it designates the product. So it says what the product is and isn't. Um, it also defines a specific geographical region where the product is produced. Um, the next thing it does is it defines the qualities and characteristics of that production and the place in which it originates. Um, it also links the human and geographic factors between the product and the environment, and it prevents the appellation from becoming a generic name. So all this, what it's saying in very short layman's terms, is that tequila is a protected product like champagne. So tequila has to be made in Mexico. It has to be made in these five specific regions and nowhere else. The other thing is it has to be made under the rules and regulations put upon it that actually say what tequila is and what it can be. And in the context of Mexico, that would be a nom. A nom is a rule in Mexico which lays out for you all the different elements of what a product is. And so that's going to define all the specific characteristics. It's going to tell you what it can be made with, how it can be made, when it can be made, why it can be made, and all those kind of things. So in the nom for tequila, I'm not going to show you the nom, it's very long, it's it's more of like a very like legal-esque document just laid out very specifically telling you exactly what things are scientifically. Um, but there's some different categorizations. And in the non, there's one thing that most people don't know about. Tequila actually has two different classes of tequila. There's not just tequila. There's actually tequila 100% de agave tequila. And there's tequila as in just the word tequila. And when I say tequila like this, I tend to go like this with the bunny rabbit ears to say tequila. Because it's not pure. It's a little bit different. 
So tequila 100% de agave is actually made with 100% of agave. So that means every drop of juice in that bottle comes from an agave plant, where tequila only has to be 51% agave. And 49% of those sugars uh, come from some other kind of shane, uh, cane sugar source or varietal. So before they actually ferment, they take 51% of the agave, extract the juice, and then they add sugar to it before they ferment. So it's a cheaper production methodology. It allows you to make tequila quicker, uh, more efficient, but at the same time, it doesn't quite give you the same taste because you're adding things to it that are not agave. So you're not just getting that beautiful, clean agave presence, you're getting other things. Um, there's nothing wrong with that per se, it's just a different perspective. And we do not do that at Hiatus. We are 100% de agave, as are most of the big brands that you know today. Um, but the NOM also does another thing that a lot of people don't know about, is it gives specific classifications for these two classes. So in tequila, 100% agave, you can have a silver, or we sometimes call it a blanco. You can also have a younger gold. Sometimes you'll see it as like an oro, um, you can, or a hoven. Uh, you can also have aged, which is the context of añejo. You can have an extra aged. Oh, sorry, age would be reposado in this case. And then um, extra aged would be añejo, which is one year. And then you can have ultra aged, or um, ultra añejo, or extra añejo, um, as you'll see in our market. But you can have all these five classifications in both classes. So it's possible to have these in 100% agave and also in tequila. So just because you're buying an ultra añejo that costs a fortune, it doesn't necessarily make it's made completely with agave. You really have to read the label and understand what you're getting because you could be getting a tequila that's a much cheaper production that has been aged for a very long time, but it's not going to be the same flavor characteristics or quality that it would be with 100% agave. And one of the reasons we really harp on 100% agave and why we really like it is that it takes more time, it takes more effort, but you're also using 100% of the one product. So you taste more of the actual essence of the tequila, and at the same time, there's going to be less um, cogeners in it to influence your system. So there's going to be less things floating in there that are bad for you. So it takes less for your body to process, less enzymes, because you're not breaking down multiple substances, you're breaking down one substance, you're only breaking down tequila. And the really cool thing about tequila is that when you think of tequila, it actually has a sugar in it called agave. And the agave sugar is so complex that your body can't handle it. But your body actually recognizes that. And your body filters, separates it, and does what's called toxic dump syndrome. And removes it straight to your colon. So when you drink tequila, technically you're absorbing less calories. And most people say it gives you less of a hangover if you're drinking good tequila. Now granted, we've all had that experience where we've had that one night, or we've drank that bad tequila, or we had way too much. And that's going to affect you like any other alcohol will. But good tequila actually will give you less of a hangover because it's easier for your body to process. Your body doesn't absorb that sugar, unlike in other products. When you think of like whiskey or when you think of like uh, vodka, your body actually tries to read that alcohol as the product it's made from. It reads certain symbols and it'll be like, oh, this is potato. But in, re in reality, it's a potato vodka. And your body absorbs that alcohol into your system. And then you have to reflush it out of your system as opposed to just flushing it at the source. So it's not getting completely wiped from your system. Your body's having to find it and pull it out. That's why sometimes you get like that groggy, achy, bony feeling or like your muscles are kind of sore because sometimes it actually makes it into your system. And with tequila, if you're drinking good, clean tequila with no additives, for the most part, you'll never, ever, ever experience that horrible sensation because it cleans right out of your body beautifully. Um, so there's a reason why we like 100% agave tequila. Besides the fact that it gives you no hangovers, it's also um, pure quality and it's um, it takes more time and effort. Um, So here, the correct terminology would be category and classification. So you have the two categories of tequila, and then you have the five different classifications per tequila. Now, when I said types of tequila, this is what I mean by types of tequila in today's presentation. And we'll get into this more later. We'll actually like break it down and talk about the different age statements and stuff. But for the most part, what we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about that there is this concept that exists. And then we're going to move into the production. And while we get through production, we'll actually bring up these different contexts. Um, but it's something that a lot of people don't know about. They think they're just drinking tequila. And when they go to a bar and they just order tequila soda and they don't think about it and they don't know what they're doing and they really don't care, what they're really doing is they could be getting one of two products, a very clean product that's really good for you or a really cheap product that could really give you a bad hangover and really affect your system. And I don't know about you, but when I'm having a good night, I want to keep my night good and I always want to wake up sober and I always want to feel good, even if I am having a drink or two. So... Here I'm pulling up just kind of like a picture of the NOM. Um, and this is what I mean by it's very like, it's very legal, it's very laid out very cleanly, just so you can get an image of it. Um, that's why I didn't pull it up and really make this presentation based off of it. It's a lot of information, so let me break it down for you. Uh, but this is the actual specific part of the NOM that kind of breaks down the different categories and classifications. 
Um, and as you can see, it's, it's a lot of jargon, but it talks about exactly what we just talked about, where there are two classes and then there are the different like subclassifications. All right, my friends. So like I said, we'll get back to the different types here in a second, but let us actually move into the next part. We're gonna talk about production methodology. So agave and tequila is all pretty much made the same way, but there's different methods. So in this next category, you really have to think of what we're doing is almost a kitchen. There's a lot of different tools that give you the same outcome, but for the most part, the kitchens are all different. So it's the context of almost cooking a potato. And I love the potato analogy. So when you think of a potato, there's a lot of different ways to make a baked potato or a potato, not baked, but a, a potato. Um, you can fry a potato, you can bake a potato, you can microwave a potato, you can do a boil a potato. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do to this potato. And in tequila, it's the same kind of context. We're using the agave, which actually is really similar to a potato. It's completely made out of starch. And you have to turn that starch into a sugar somehow and through a process called sacrification. And so you have to turn it from a starch to a sugar and you're using these different methodologies to do so. And so as we're gonna move into the next section, just keep in mind, we're making tequila no matter what. All of these different production methodologies all make tequila. It's just there's different ways and some have pros and some have cons, some are better, some are less. And a lot of that's gonna be biased. It's gonna be coming from my personal perspective as well as from a brand perspective because we sit in a certain production methodology for a reason. Um, there are other production methodologies that some people in the industry kind of frown upon um, for certain reasons, and we'll get into that as well. Um, but I'm going to try to be as biased or un I'm sorry, I'm going to try to be as unbiased as possible. But I would like to inform you that, of course, there is going to be a slight bias on my part um, from my personal experience as a tequila consultant and also as a brand ambassador for a specific brand. All right, my friends, let's move into it. So the first thing I want to talk about is Hiatus Tequila and myself work very closely with a specific part of the Mexican government called the Consejo de Regulatory de Tequila. Now, they're not actually part of the government. They are a, a non-profit uh, monitoring organization that the government created to help monitor and the whole industry of tequila. And they do everything from making sure that the agave that goes in the ground is documented to making sure that the tequila in the bottle is 100% tequila, no one tampered with it, as well as they also go into international trade law. So if tequila shows up in another country, but it's not actually tequila and they find it, they're the ones who are allowed to prosecute and uh, make sure that legal action is taken against anyone who may be trying to hurt the tequila trade. They're kind of like the protectors of the organization of tequila. So here is the Consejo Regulatory Tequila's uh, symbol at the bottom of the page. And we actually partner with them. We bring them into New York City, as well as other cities, um, multiple times a year. And what we do is through these bringing them in, we do tequila education for bartenders and also for people who are heavy in the industry. And we allow them to kind of learn directly from the horse's mouth about the different types of tequila and what tequila is and what tequila does. And so what we're doing here throughout this, you know, kind of break that we're on is we're kind of breaking down a bunch of their information that they offer. Uh, the whole class is about six hours. So we're doing one hour segments kind of touching on certain topics. Um, so today we're talking on types of tequila and production methodology. Uh, but if you do live in New York, Florida, Missouri, or Indiana, please let us feel free to reach out to us on Instagram or anywhere else. And we'd be glad to give you information on um, when we host these classes and to see if we can get you into it. Unfortunately, right now, the education sector of the Mexican government for the Consejo Regulatory is uh, closed down, but they will be reopening as soon as everything else reopens. So don't worry, my friends, there will be opportunities to get certified. Um, and you do get certified. You get a gilded certificate from the Consejo Regulatory de Tequila that acknowledges your name, that you are certified in tequila. And it's a really cool thing. I have been CRT certified as well as my whole team. Um, I think so. I think my whole team at this point is now certified. Uh, but it's, a, it's kind of a cool thing. and It's a nice thing to add to your resume. Um, but feel free to reach out to us um, and maybe we can see if we can get you signed up. Uh, so back to our presentation. Uh, now, on that note, the reason I brought this whole thing up is a lot of this information coming forward is going to be taken directly from their presentation and refactored in a way to kind of like share it with you. So this information is coming directly from the Mexican CRT organization. This is not their presentation. This is not them saying it, disclaimer, disclaimer, but this is very similar to the information that they provide in their course. Um, like I said, this is not their course. This is very similar information. And the only reason I bring them up is to let you know that you have the opportunity of joining their full, full course um, by contacting us. And we can try to get you in touch with taking one of the classes. All right, my friends. So here, once again, just like on the left of the presentation, you have all the different stages of the tequila process laid out very cleanly for you. And this is what we're gonna be going over. Um, there are seven true stages, sorry, eight true stages, let's get my bad, can't count this morning, haven't had enough coffee. Uh, there are eight true stages of the tequila process. And then there's one extra, which is kind of like the ninth stage, which we will talk about. 
but these are the ones that are specifically laid out by the Consejo Regulatory de Tequila, so we will stick with them. The first stage is called the quema, which is the harvest. Um, you have to obtain the product to be fermented. The next step is hydrolysis or cooking, and that's the process of turning that starch in that agave into a sugar so that we can ferment it. Next step is extraction. So once you turn it into a starch, you have to extract that juice, or once you take that starch and turn it into a sugar, you have to extract that sugar to be able to ferment it. Um, the next step is formulation. This is when we kind of talk about, you know, whether we're going to make 100% agave tequila or whether they're going to make other tequila. Uh, and then after you know what you're doing, you can make the, like, the actual fermentation. Um, then you go into distillation, which hopefully we all know about distillation, but we will have a brief little conversation as well. And then you can age it, and then you can bottle it. Um, as you saw, there are five different types of tequila, and those are different age statements. We talk about the Blanco, the Repo, the Hoven, the Añejo, and the Extra Añejo. Um, those are different age statements which affect tequila. They're all tequila, but it's how you treat that tequila which makes those different categories. So before we get in heavy here, let's take a second to actually learn a little bit about agave. Because maybe you do or do not know about agave. Uh, this is not my image, it is sourced on the bottom left of where I've got this. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please reference them. They're a beautiful source to kind of figure out more information about agave. But this is what an agave plant looks like. Most people don't know that. They are used to the picture that we had in the previous slide right here, where you have the big flowering kind of blossom of uh, spiky spikies. Um, and that is what the agave looks like. That's blue Weber agave. And then what happens is as that plant actually reaches sexual maturity and able to reproduce and create seeds and pollen and that kind of stuff, it looks more like this. For the most part, you'll never see this because in the tequila industry, we actually castrate the plant. Right as the plant is about to bloom, we cut the stalk so that it doesn't actually have the ability to reproduce. What that does is it causes the heart of the cactus, the pina, or the actual fruiting body, to swell. And so the center of the, the cactus, underneath all those spikes, actually will start to get really fat and start swelling and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is the part that we actually will be able to extract the juices from. So right here, deep in the center of the plant, is where we'll be able to get that pina, or uh, the pineapple or cabeza, uh, of the, the actual cactus. And that's what we're going to get. So the first step is the hema. So once the plant is ripe, which takes about seven to seven and a half years, yes, it takes about seven to seven and a half years to get one cactus to start making tequila. It is the only spirit in the entire world that has such a long start cycle to be able to make a product. And that's part of the reason why the non-100% agave tequila started becoming popular, because it takes less of the plant to do it. Every other spirit in the world can be made every single year. And I challenge you to tell me one that doesn't. You can make any, you can make baiju, you can make sochu, as long as it's not an aging process, every other single product, the actual necessity ingredients can be created every year. Rice is grown every year. Wheat is grown everywhere. Potatoes are grown every year. Grapes are grown every year. There's nothing else that takes seven years to just grow the plant, unlike agave. Agave takes seven years just to create the plant. It should be the most expensive spirit in the world, but that'll be another conversation that we're gonna have next week. Um, all right, my friends, so now you've kind of got a better understanding of the plants. Um, you can see all the different parts. You can see the root and stem system. You can see the, the panca, the sharp pointy sticks. And in the center is the pina, the kind of the cabeza, the part that's going to turn into a plant. Uh, you have the quiote up here, the actual like fruiting plant. And then at the very top, you have all the flowers. All right, so the first step, the very first step here is the jima. And the jima actually is a word in Spanish, which means harvest. And the el jimador is the person who does the harvesting. So in the bottom left here, you have a beautiful picture of a jimador. Um, in Mexico, they used to wear big white cloth, and they'd use a tool called a coa to cut down the branches of the agave. And once they cut out all the spikes, you have what looks like the center picture here. That's what the center of the plant looks like without the spikes, kind of like a jicama or a sweet potato, kind of like just a naked potato. They cut off all the outside, and um, they skinned it. Um, but the jimador, you may have heard of el jimador tequila. El jimador, the jimador is the person who does the jima. And then during the jima, you get the pina, or the cabeza, or the center of the cactus, the pineapple. And then that is the part that is going to go. Um, so here's kind of a little bit of the picture process. The jima door cuts it down. It looks like the center picture. And then at the right, you get another picture of kind of like how big the tools are in reference to these things. Um, now granted, agave can grow five meters wide and five meters tall. They're very, very big. Um, not all of them get that big, but they do get taller than a normal sized person and wider than a person can reach. They're very large plants. So just to follow the process of the Hima, this is kind of what an agave field looks like in case you've never seen it. Uh, beautiful red soil um, in the land of uh, Jalisco. Um, absolutely beautiful plants. Um, they plant them in rows, so they're really easy, easy to harvest. Um, but when it does come to harvest time, it's a really quick process. Um, they go, they pull up the plant, they chop off the branches, and this is kind of what the aftermath looks like. Rows and rows and rows just kind of laid out. 
um, with the cabeza exposed, and you can see why they call them a pineapple. If you look at the branches kind of sticking out of the pina, it kind of looks like a pineapple. It's kind of naked on the outside with almost like a uh, hex comb kind of styling on the sides, and then at the very top you have kind of like what looks like the, the, the fronds of a pineapple. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what it looks like after a field's been harvested. I think it's a great picture and kind of something that most people don't get to see. Um, so the next step, once you have the hema finished, you've harvested, now you have to collect all these plants and it's time to start the process. So like I said, you have to use a process called sacrification. These plants themselves cannot make any spirit. You have to use a sugar to make a spirit. The sugar is what ferments. So what you have to do is you have to take the starch in this very, very, very starchy plant and you have to turn it into a sugar called, through a process called sacrification that happens through heat. There's multiple different methods to heat it. The process is also known as hydrolysis or cooking. So you have to cook it. And there's multiple methods. We're about to show you what they are. But the concept is you have to think of this kind of like as an, it's almost like a jicama. It's very hard. It's a dense, dense root, fibrous, fibrous, fibrous plant. And tequila is not really a cactus. It's more related to the asparagus family. So it's very fibrous and stringy. And the thing is, once you heat it, it takes all that starch and turns it into a sugar. So by the time it comes out of the oven, it's almost like rope that's been soaked in honey. It's very fibrous and it's very dense in this concentrated thick, thick, thick syrup. And then you have to press that out. Um, the other thing about tequila is it, you can't really eat it raw. Tequila has a very stringent acid on it almost, um, and it's abrasive to your skin. It can give you blisters. It can make you feel almost like the feeling of insulation on your skin where you feel like you're getting pinpricked constantly. Um, also the plants themselves, those big panka, like the big protective leaves around it, are very sharp and you can actually cut yourself with them, like more than a paper cut, like they're serious. So that's why they wear those big like sleeved, like white garments, is to really protect themselves while they're doing the hema. All right, back to the presentation. So the next step is hydrolysis or cooking. It's that process we're talking about. Here in the background, there's a picture of our ovens at La Cofradia, um, and you use an oven to cook. Um, an oven in Spanish is called horno, uh, the horno is the oven. Um, and you use it to take the agave and you infuse heat. And what it does is it turns the starch and the insulin polymers into simple sugars, um, such as glucose and fructose, and then that's what you actually ferment. So just continuing hydrolysis. Um, to do this, to heat it, in tequila there are three industry standards to do so. Um, the old ancient artisanal way, which isn't really done anymore, was to dig a big pit in the earth and then to line it with wood, and you would burn the wood into coal, and then you would line the pina on top of that, and you would smoke it. That's very similar to what they do in mezcal. Um, if you look at any ancestral type of mezcal, they actually use that production methodology. Um, it kind of moved out of the tequila world when tequila became popular, big booming. Tequila went to the industrialized world, where mezcal stayed in the more like artisanal, small batch, regional kind of, I can only make it a limited production quantity kind of world. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you don't see it in tequila much. There are a couple brands that do make a smoked tequila, but for the most part, we don't find smoked tequila. What we do find, though, is tequila that's cooked with a oven, an oven, which is listed here on the left. Or if you want to go to the next kind of more industrialized process, you use this thing in the middle. Um, this big tube is called an autoclave or an autoclave. Um, autoclaves are kind of like pressure cookers. So when you think of a kitchen, you have your different tools. You have your oven, you have your pressure cooker. Um, and the pressure cooker, the autoclave, you can either turn on the pressure or turn it off. There are certain brands who use it just kind of like a big industrialized oven. They use it as just the big tube. They heat up the tube, they pump in air, the air circulates kind of like a convection oven, and it heats it more evenly throughout. Um, but then there are other brands who turn on the pressure. And the thing is, the oven itself can take up to 32 hours just to heat, where this autoclave can take about 18 hours. So it cuts the time almost down in half, if not more, uh, for the process of cooking the agave. And so some people really favor it, but it does tend to give you one note. The oven, what happens is the agave on the bottom tend to get pressed by the weight of all the agave stacked on top. Um, the agave on the top is where all the steam gets pumped in the room, so they tend to overcook. And the agave on the middle kind of get affected by the both, and so it's just like the just right. So this is like the Goldilocks zones. The ones on bottom are pressed down and get really squished and are heated against the wood on, or against the stone floor in these stone ovens, and so they get really cooked. The ones on the top are getting all the steam, so they get overcooked. The ones in the middle get just right. So you have this blend of sugar, so by the time you extract it, you have this beautiful caramelization of sugar and this beautiful process, so it tends to create a more robust, complex tequila. So ovens create a more robust, complex tequila. So when you taste it, you get more notes, kind of like scotch, where you experience a roller coaster in your mouth, where you have this kind of whirlwind of expression. Um, autoclaves tend to give you more of one note. So when you taste an autoclave tequila, they tend to be very specific. So if you're tasting a tequila that's just like one note, it's like, it's just citrus. I get nothing else. For the most part, those are going to be more of your autoclave tequilas. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a more quicker production methodology, and it's a it's a it's a it's a conscious choice. 
So in our tequila, we use an oven because we want you to have a kind of that depth of complexity. It's a sipping tequila. We want you to experience all the flavors. Autoclave tequilas are great for mixing. They're great for margaritas, great for other things. Um, some of them are great to sip on, but you get, like I said, one note. It's kind of like a pure flavor. Um, others are not so much, not so pleasurable because they're one note. And sometimes you don't want the same note again and again and again. Now, the only other way to do this process is through a process called a diffuser. And the picture here on the right is a picture of a diffuser. Um, they're huge industrialized machines that take up the space of roughly a football field in length. They are very, very long. And what happens in the diffuser is there's multiple different types. Um, I'm only going to talk about the type the Mexican government really harps on, and it's called um, an extraction and vertical autoclave diffuser. So the first step of the diffuser, what it does is on the bottom picture here, you see these kind of like ramps that look like they're going into the plant. So these ramps here, what they do is they're wood chippers. So you kind of drop the agave in, it goes up the escalator on a wood chipper and it gets washed with water. The water washes out all the sugar and then it goes up the next and it does the same and it goes up the next and it does the same and then it falls into this big machine. And this big machine is the actual autoclave. And the autoclave, what it does is it has hot water jets that pump steam in from the side and really, really, really cook the agave and extract as much sugar as possible. Now, the only issue with this is because you're cutting the agave so much and you're pumping it full of so much water, that at the very end of the cycle, you're gonna have a very, very thin, 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 thin uh, mosto muerto, uh, mosto. So uh, the mosto is uh, the juice of the agave that's been extracted. So this kind of like sugary juice is called mosto, and it's gonna be very thin because you have so much water with the sugar. Uh, when you use an oven, um, you're just getting the sugar. Autoclave, you're just getting sugar, you're not extracting it. Here in this process, it's kind of both. It does the cooking and the extraction. Um, so you, you get a very thin, and it also has like very much one note to it as well. Um, most of these are used for your more like mass-produced tequilas, your well tequilas, your speed pours, um, and a lot of non-100% agave tequilas made this way. Um, now, uh, the next step after you cook the plant is you have to extract it. So on the left, you have what's called a tahona. Um, some tequila companies use this, but the tequila companies that do tend to only use a tahona. And some of the brands that make tahona tequila are like Siete Leguas or Fortaleza or um, Suerta but they only tend to make their one brand. Reason being is it's very time consuming to make a Tahona tequila. So what happens is this Tahona, as in the bottom picture you can kind of see, is like a big mortar and pestle. That rock that you see in the top sits into that groove on the bottom uh, picture and it rolls around in a circle and it weighs about two tons. It's a very, very heavy rock and it rolls for hours and hours and hours on end. So what happens is after you cook your agave, After you cook your agave, you take the plant straight from the oven and you'd throw it in a tahona. And the tahona is going to press it out. So what it's doing is it's pressing all this kind of like, like I said, it, when it comes out, it's kind of like a fibrous rope covered in sugar. So it takes this like, like kind of rope covered in sugar and presses all that sugar out of the rope, leaving it very dry. And then you collect all that sugar and then you can ferment that. So using a tahona, you use the least amount of water. You're not really washing it a lot. So it's going to be a very thick syrup. So you tend to get more of the flavor of the agave, more natural flavors. The next methodology is the middle. It's called a milling process. Um, these are all milling processes, but the next one uses an actual mill, like an industrial mill. So the top one here is kind of the same thing that you would use in the autoclave. You see it's kind of like a vertical escalator with a wood chipper on it. The agave goes up into the wood chipper, shreds it, and then gets washed with water. Now, this process kind of looks like this. So you have your different, you have your different um, escalators. So the agave gets loaded on, it goes up, it falls into a wood chipper, goes down, falls into the next one, goes up. It's loaded, falls down, and each step of the way, there's a bunch of water jets along this thing. So it washes down all the sugar from the agave as it goes, and it collects them in these pools at the bottom. And these pools at the bottom, they can then be used to ferment the tequila, and they're segregated they're into multiple sections. So the first pool obviously has the most sugar. The next pool will have the second most, least most, least most, and they wash out all the sugar. And then the master tequila distiller can choose these different pools and what the blend is going to be out of all these sugars to make the tequila. So it gives you a little bit of range of expression as opposed to having a very thick syrup you can water it down and stretch it out. That tends to make more tequila, but you're tending to make a lighter tequila with less flavor. Um, so it's, it's a discussion and a decision that the master distiller gets to make. Um, the other one here at the very bottom is another type of milling process. The bottom picture in the middle is called a screw mill. What we actually use. It's kind of like a combination between a tahona and a mill. Um, what happens is the agave does get shredded, but then it falls into this conical funnel. You see this big spinning kind of like tool. What happens is it's surrounded in a cage and it presses the agave against the skies, uh, against the sides to squeeze out the juice. So it's kind of like that mortar and pestle concept. So you shred the agave, you wash out all the juice, and at the very end, you kind of wring it dry, almost like a sponge. So it kind of gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you the press of the tahona, it gives you the shred and efficiency of a mill, but at the same time, you use less water. So you tend to have a more flavorful tequila. 
Once again, for a brand like us who wants to be sipping tequila, we're trying to get as many notes and expressions into that tequila as possible. It's really what we're living for, is trying to enhance the flavor. Now, the last method here, once again you see, is a diffuser. So once I said, the diffuser, at least the one that the Mexican government recognizes, um, uses both a vertical autoclave and an extractor. So they kind of do it backwards. So they at first extract, and then they cook the juice. So they use this methodology where they shred it, they shred it, they wash all the juice out, then they put it through these big steam jets, steam jets, steaming it out. And so you get all the sugar, but you also have shredded it so much, you get all these like fine particles of other things inside the juice as well. And then they go back and they put it in an autoclave. But the autoclave doesn't look like this. It's a vertical autoclave. It's gonna be long, tall, it doesn't look like this. It's gonna be long, tall, and skinny, kind of like my mouse is doing, it'll be standing up like this. And so they pour it in the top and they pressurize the autoclave and it cooks it and then it drains out the bottom. But the only problem with this is now that you've shredded all the things before cooking, you're also adding in all those impurities. And as we know in the spirits world, the impurities are what flavor your product. And with agave, we really just want to taste agave. We don't want a lot of extra impurities. Um, those impurities are what really affect your system and give you the hangover, but they also give you the flavor. Like vodka would have absolutely no flavor if it wasn't for impurities. But in tequila, we want agave. We don't want the extra impurities. We're not trying to enhance or in flavor in any certain way. Now, there are some natural impurities that do happen, like with the tahona. The tahona is a big stone on stone action. You're gonna add minerality. So it tends to be a little bit more like almost limestone. -y. It tends to hit like a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, the milling process that we're talking about in the middle here has absolutely no impurities that come with the process. And then the extraction process, um, when it comes to a diffuser, has a lot of impurities. Um, and then they have to filter those out. And every time you filter something out, you're taking away more flavor as well. There's no way that you can just pinpoint what you want to filter. You can't put everything in a bucket and say, oh, I only want the, the blue m &Ms, and have a magical filtering that funnels out all the blue m &Ms. It doesn't work like that. Um, so yeah, diffusers are the most industrialized process. We tend to not like them um, so much when you come to the more like artisanal side of tequila uh, because it, it's a more mass-produced production methodology that doesn't put the time, effort, love, and care into it. And also you tend to have to add additives afterwards to build back up the flavor because you're filtering out all the flavor to begin with. And that's something that we really kind of strive against. Um, hiatus, we have absolutely zero additives. So when you think of our tequila, you're tasting pure 100% de agave tequila with nothing else in the bottle. Um, and that's what we like. Uh, diffusers, you tend to have to add flavor afterwards to kind of give any body to it because you're extracting all of the flavor out with the filtering process that comes with the diffuser. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a more industrialized method. As every industry has, they have their more industrialized processes and the more artisanal side. And we're of that more artisanal side. All right, so in extraction, here's just kind of a picture of the juice that gets squeezed out of the agave. It's very dark, it's very brown, and it's very unique. If you ever have a chance, I encourage you to go to Mexico. There's one smell in the world that you will never forget, and that is the smell of a tequila distillery. It haunts you, it lingers with you, it's beautiful. Whether you like it or not, you will never forget that smell. You can walk into a room and if it smells like a distillery, you know. I know when I walk into a room and there's like fresh agave that's been cooked somewhere because it smells just like a distillery. It's a very unique smell. When I went down to Mexico for my first time, a lot of people were like, what is that smell? And then there were also people who were like, oh my God, that's beautiful, what is it? And it became a very unique thing for a lot of different people, it was an experience. But still, it's an experience that once you smell it again, you know you're in a tequila factory. There's no exception. Last time I went down to Mexico, I visited five distilleries. And every time you got close to the distillery, you knew because you could just smell that agave coming out of the oven. It was just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So please, if you ever get a chance, go to Mexico. But um, this is kind of a picture of the extraction process and what the juice looks like. So after it gets squeezed out, um, the picture on the left here is kind of like the end process of what would be a screw mill. Um, so the screw mill is just above and it's squeezing all the juice and the juice is raining down and being caught in a big vat to then be fermented. On the picture on the right here, it's kind of a picture of the big vat that has the juices that are pooling into it to be fermented. So looking at our little chart on the left, we're getting through this. Um, first step we had was the hema. Then we moved into hydrolysis and cooking. Then we went to extraction, which we just finished talking about. So it's very easy and clear to see that our next step is going to be fermentation. But before we do that, I just want to pull up this picture. This is kind of the picture of a diffuser. I just want to get you a better understanding. Um, there are very few diffusers in Mexico. There's roughly about 10 that I know of. Um, they're about the size of a football field. They're very large machines. Um, there are pictures that I can show you where they are longer than warehouses. They're very, very huge machines. They're big, industrialized. They cost millions of dollars. That's why you don't see them everywhere because they're very, very expensive. 
Um, but people do hone them to be like the new revolution of tequila. They're very industrialized. They really make tequila fast. Um, but they tend to be used for things that have flavor added to them, like I said, because the natural flavors tend to be removed. Um, but here's a picture. Um, the tequila gets loaded in, it gets shredded, as you can see, and then it ends up on this big like system of showers along a treadmill, which wash all the sugar out, and then at the very end, it gets dumped. Um, so as the water goes in, it gets washed, and then the, as the tequila moves down the conveyor belt on the bottom picture you can see here, this is the way the tequila goes. Um, the water gets pumped in here, and here's where the juice gets collected, and then as it goes, there's less and less juice until it's almost only water washing down. And then that juice is all collected and cooked in that vertical autoclave, um, I just want to kind of get you a picture so you can better understand it. Uh, the side pictures, it's really hard to kind of see them, but this is kind of what that system process looks like. So as opposed to just having a very simple, um, you know, a simple image of an oven or a simple image of like the Tahona, the big stone that spins in circles, this gives you kind of like a more hands-on like image where you can really look at it. So yeah, on to our next step. So our next step here is formulation. So this is the point in the tequila process where the tequila maker gets to choose the different class of tequila they're gonna make, the different type of tequila. So you're either gonna make tequila with the bunny rabbit ears, where it's not 100% de agave, or you're gonna make 100% de agave tequila, which means all the juice that came out of those plants is gonna go right back into fermentation. Um, tequila itself, the 51%, uh, came about when Americans kind of popularized tequila. It was a huge tequila boom, um, and the tequila boom almost was 300% uh, overnight um, when tequila became popularized in America. And this came with the uh, prohibition ending and also the margarita being created and also rock bands really promoting tequila and it really becoming a big like thing in america where we wanted this new unique spirit that was coming out of mexico and the demand was so great that they wanted to make it faster and the only way to do that they found out with the easiest way was to add sugar so all of a sudden boom we started adding sugar to the tequila process uh prior to that it was all 100 percent agave tequila um and then it, we added sugar and then we started making this other form of tequila um, and then through rules and regulations, it separated out to two categories. A long time ago, they were all called the same thing. They were just tequila. And so we made these rules to kind of like break them apart and be like, no, 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 these are two different beasts. Um, and they're very different. There's much more time consuming to make 100% pure agave tequila than it is to make just the 51% sugar tequila. It's almost half as much effort because you're only having to grow half as many plants. Um, and sugar grows every year. We make rum every year. We don't make agave every year. Well, we do, but like the plant doesn't grow every year. Uh, to be able to make tequila. So once you choose, then you make. So our company only makes 100% agave tequila, um, but there's a lot of other tequila around. Now I'm going to introduce you to this chart. Um, I'm going to kind of explain it to you real quick. So this is to total tequila production that you can kind of see in millions of liters. Um, and this only goes to 2018. I didn't update it. I'm sorry. There are more updated graphs, but this is the one that I really like because um, it really shows. So there's two different types of tequila. You can look at the blue line, which is 100% de agave tequila. And then you can look at the green line, which is tequila with the bunny rabbit ears. Now, as you can see, tequila with the bunny rabbit ears was so popular from 1995 all the way up until roughly 2007. 2007 is the first year where tequila 100% agave kind of took over and for a short period of time owned the market share. So as you can see, the 100% agave tequila is almost a new concept to us, at least when it comes to like the exportation of tequila. Prior to that, we were all drinking shitty tequila. Oh, I'm not sorry, excuse me, not shitty tequila. We were drinking non 100% agave tequila, not clean, pure tequila. We're drinking the other tequila. And so for most people who tell me, well, I had a bad experience with tequila once, blah, 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 blah. You know, you kind of have to like look at that with a grain of salt. You kind of have to like understand like where are they coming from and how old are they? Because when you reference their reference points, then you kind of better understand. Because until 2007, it wasn't really good tequila. So if you didn't really drink tequila after 2007, for the most part, you were drinking the non good tequila or the, the, just the bunny rabbit tequila. So you weren't drinking 100% agave tequila. And so it's the kind of thing where a lot of people are like, well, I had that bad experience back in college this one time ago, 50 years back. 50 years back, when you look at the tequila market, 50 years back is a whole different story. 50 years back, there was almost no 100% agave tequila being consumed in our marketplace. So it was very hard to find 100% agave tequila. You're only finding tequila. Um, and a lot of this tequila, as you can see, tequila still has a huge threshold. The green line almost has never gone down. Reason being is we use this for our mixed drinks, our mixed margaritas, our frozen machines. Tequila is the number one frozen machine product, and we are going to keep drinking it no matter what. Whether you know it or not, Americans consume 80% of all of the tequila exported from Mexico. Now, I'm going to say that one more time. Maybe it'll hit you. Americans consume 80% of all of the tequila that actually gets exported from America. So Mexico loves us. 
And we are definitely the primary consumer that drives their like purchasing habits and indexes. And so you can see here that in 2012, or um, sorry, 20, yeah, 2015, 2015 was the first time where it really made a turning point, um, where 100% agave tequila took market share and held it. We still are market share right now with the top 100% agave tequila. Um, it's more time consuming. It's, it's about us wanting to know what we put in our body. We want better products. We want better consistency. And that's our world today. We want better things. And that's kind of in 2015 where it kind of took the turn. So now in the market, you see a lot of beautiful, 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 beautiful tequilas. Um, but it wasn't the case way back when. And even where I grew up, I grew up in Texas. Um, I live in New York now, but I grew up in Texas. And in Texas, it was very hard to find 100% agave tequila. They had it, but the concept wasn't known. You were always just drinking tequila. It was never that my friend went to the store and like, oh, no, 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 let me get you the good tequila. And the good tequila could be a couple dollars more and it would still be just regular tequila as opposed to 100% agave tequila because it's not known in the common zeitgeist. And that's the whole agenda of the CRT as well as what we're trying to do. We're trying to better educate the consumer as well as better educate the people who are selling the product so that we get a better consistency in the market where people better understand how beautiful this product is and how artisanal it is. It should be the most expensive spirit in the world. It is the only product that takes seven years to grow. So if you're making a Ñejo, it could take you nine years just to bottle that one product. And when you think of the scotch industry, nine year scotches don't exist, but 10 year do. And 10 year scotches are rather expensive. They're not very affordable. They're much more expensive than a generic bottle of tequila. And when you look at the market share, the only reason tequila is so affordable is because the labor rate in Mexico is so cheap. And so, I mean, it's a wonderful and horrible thing that the labor rate is so cheap. It keeps it cheaper for us who love to consume it. But at the same time, it should be a much more expensive product. And hopefully, you never know, one day tequila might actually be the price that it deserves to be. Who knows? But in the meantime, let's enjoy it while we can, right? I don't want to put that bad juju on us. Knock on wood. All right. So that kind of puts in frame of reference why the two types of tequila exist. There is a generic consumption tequila, and then there's more of the sipping tequila or the artisanal tequila. And for the most part, the artisanal tequila has kind of taken over the uh, generic tequila market share. But they both have huge volume. It, we never went down. We just increased our drinking habits. All right, so um, the next step is fermentation. So there's three different ways to ferment. We've extracted the juice. Once we extract the juice, now we have to start turning it into the product after we've decided what type of tequila we're gonna make. So the old school way here is listed on the left, um, which are fermentation vats or clay pots. Here's an image of fermentation vats from um, Don Arete. Um, they're big pools made out of either ceramic, clay, or sometimes concrete. I think these ones are concrete. And what happens is all the musto gets pumped in there and then that's where they're able to bubble and ferment. Um, it's kind of an older concept. Very few people use these because they are either completely stationary like this. You cannot move it. You cannot replace it. And if it cracks, you have to completely make a new one or, um, they're small batch. Like the old way of doing it was using, uh, clay pots and the clay pots are, would be like about as big as you can reach in a circle. Uh, but they don't hold very much. So it's the kind of thing where it's not very efficient and efficiency is key when it comes to more industrialized process like tequila and mezcal, they still use the pots, but here we're going to use a more industrialized process. Um, if you're not going to use a clay, the next option is wood. So these wood tanks here in the middle are fermentation tanks. Um, they're big, they're tall. The only thing about them is they have to be replaced every three to five years. Um, reason being is the wood will start to rot, will start to wear down. You are pumping in liquid and adding yeast and it's fermenting. And that fermentation affects things. The yeast also interacts with the wood and it uh, creates a microbiome. And the microbiome itself inside these wood vats also tend to help decompose and break down the wood. Uh, some people really like fermentation tanks because they say that it adds more flavor because the yeast have more interaction with the actual wood and the actual product. And some people say that that actually creates an effect on the tequila. Um, that, that's, it's hearsay and it's kind of like a preference. Uh, yes and no. Um, and it depends. Uh, but this is kind of a, a nice little process. Uh, some brands like Fortaleza do use open air wood fermentation. But once again, they have to be replaced every three to five years. Um, the last option here is kind of uh, is stainless steel tanks kind of the same concept as the wood tank but made out of steel nice thing about them is they're easy to be cleaned um they never have to be replaced and you can use them again and again now the microbiome works just as well in a stainless steel tank as it does in a wood tank there's no kind of studies really to prove that it works better in one than the other uh, but at the same time you know we all have our preference and we all have our flavor and this kind of thing is once we do something that works well we're going to stick with it we're not going to change because it could change the flavor it can change the outcome it's the kind of concept where there are stills in scotland where people are so like superstitious about it that when they get a new still, they will literally take one still and set it next to the other still. And they will look at the outside of the still and look for the dents. And they will literally try to recreate the exact same dents on the exact same spots on the new still as they were on the old still to give the same flavor. Because as it's fermenting, that liquid hits the sides and falls back in. 
and you're gonna change the flavor profile if it doesn't have the exact same contextual frame of reference. And so that's why they'll actually dent the stills of a brand new still almost identically to the old still to make sure it's the same. Um, but it's more of like a distilling methodology. So here, it's a choice and a production. We actually use stainless steel tanks. Unlike the other two things here where the last option was kind of the bad option, there's not really a bad option here. Um, they're all great options, it's for fermenting. Um, the thing about stainless steel, like I said, it's easier to clean, you can reuse it a hundred times, and the wood doesn't really add a lot of flavor. You're not getting any kind of like aging or not getting any like influence that way. It's just the microbiome of the yeast, and depending on where you are, some people's yeasts are gonna be more active or less active, um, but the wood also adds kind of like a grippiness on the side, so it tends to hold in more bacteria as well. So there's pros and cons to both. The one thing though is the stainless steel never has to be replaced. So it's really nice. Um, you rarely see the, st uh, the fermentation vats like I showed you here though. They're, they're much more of an old school concept. They do exist. All right, after you ferment, which is adding the yeast to the musto and letting the yeast or interact for about three, uh, for one to three days to kind of get the level of alcohol you need, the next thing you do is distill. Um, I don't wanna get heavy into the distilling process, but here's a nice image that kind of like details all the different parts of the still. Um, this is known as an albemic still, um, all right, alembic still. Alembic stills, um, and this is a copper, it's also known as a pot still. Um, it has a big heating element where all the juice is put in, and then as it gets heated, uh, in cycles, it bubbles and boils the, the gases down through the, the swoon arm into the vapor condenser um, in stages. The first things that come off are gonna be the heads, the next part's the heart, and the next part's the tails, and everything else that's left in there is gonna be um, uh, vinasas or the bad stuff and you just kind of pour that out and so as you distill this um, you're creating tequila now the thing about tequila is tequila has to be distilled twice um, reason being is the first distillate called the ordinario has so much methanol in it they can actually pickle your liver you cannot drink the ordinario and if you drink it for a long period of time you will actually poison yourself um, one thing about methanol that most people don't know is methanol uh, turns to formaldehyde in your liver and so formaldehyde is what we use to pickle cadavers and help embalm um, in the process of death. Um, so we don't want to become living death. So we don't want to literally be killing ourselves. Um, tequila, the methanol is created in that sacrification process of turning the starch into a sugar. Um, other products do have methanol, but l much, much, much lower methods. So like when you look at like whiskey, whiskey can produce methanol in the process. But you're going to get very, 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 very low concentrations as opposed to tequila, where the concentrations are very, very high because it's a very, very starchy substance with uh, no sugar to begin with. So we're gonna do our fermentation. We're gonna do two distillates. Um, after our second round of distilling, we actually get to our product. And our product is gonna be this beautiful, clean tequila. So here on the left is an image of Ordinario. It's kind of what it looks like the first distill. It's cloudy. Um, when I was down in Mexico, I actually tasted the Ordinario of every single distillery I went to um, in very small quantities. I wasn't gonna kill myself, but I wanted to see what it tasted like. And it has a very methanol -y, kind of like gasoline-esque quality to it. It's not very clean and it has a very strange flavor. Uh, but the nice, beautiful, pure tequila is what you get at the next point. And um, as you can see, they're very different. Now, distilling in Mexico, there's multiple distilling types. Um, there's copper stills, uh, alembic stills. Um, the ones here on the left are pot stills, just like the alembic still I showed you before. They're just made out of stainless steel. And then the ones on the right here are what's called a column still. Um, it's a vertical still. And they have different plate levels and on each plate level the distilling process happens almost in its own little micro uh, microcosm so you're distilling a lot so what happens on the left is it's called a discontinuous distillation because you have to distill once and then distill again on the right it's a continuous distillation because it distills 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 all of the way up um, i'm not going to get really heavy into the process this isn't a distilling lecture um, but you can easily look up the difference between a continuous still and a discontinuous still or an alembic still and a column still um, column stills or kofri stills, um, like this one, um, tend to be used a lot in like the Japanese whiskey industry. Um, there are very few people in the tequila industry who use them, but they do exist. Um, this is a picture from Tecalenia, um, the same people who make uh, Don Filano, and they actually have one on their site. They don't use it for Don Filano, but it's on their site, and some of the brands that they do make use it. Um, it creates a higher proof alcohol, so you have to water it down more in the long run. Olympic stills tend to come out at a cleaner proof. Um, at a lower proof, so you don't have to water it down as much to get to the regulation numbers. And then um, the other one comes out at a higher proof, so you add more water to lower it down. So you get more uh, more product, but at the same time, you're getting it more watered down. And that's something we don't like in the industry. We like to keep all the flavor in essence and try to keep it nice and concentrated. Um, after you do your distilling, you do your aging. Um, aging has to be done in oak barrels. That's the only really rule and regulation. It has to be oak barrels. Um, and you can do whatever oak barrel you want. Chardonnay barrel, charred oak, ex-bourbon. We use ex-bourbon barrels. 
Um, but whatever it is, um, there's a lot of factors that affect aging uh, with temperature, humidity, also alcohol, and the number of cycles the barrel's been used. In Mexico, they tend to run the barrels until they're dead just because barrels are very expensive. Um, almost every distillery has a cooper on site, but for the most part, they're not building barrels. They're fixing, repairing, and mending. Um, the tequila industry tends to get hand-me-downs from every other industry, and there's nothing wrong with that. It makes beautiful tequila, and we love drinking it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip on, but we can look at the slide later if you want to come back to the presentation. So aging. Aging happens in multiple stages. You have your Blanco, which can be aged up to two months, and there's no limit on size of the barrel. The Blanco can be aged. There are some Blancos that actually get aged. Uh, then you have your Reposado, which is aged at least two months, um, and it's aged in oak barrels. You have your Ñejo, which is aged at least one year, and then you have your Extra Ñejo, which is three years plus. So now you're having your different classifications. So once again, you have tequila or 100% de agave tequila, and then you have your different types. Uh, the one type that was discussed earlier that is not here is called Oro or Hoven or Young Tequila, and all that is is a blend of a Blanco and any of the other age statements. So if you ever look on a bottle and it says gold or oro or hoven, it's literally a blend. And it could be a blanco and an extra niejo. It could be the most fanciest hoven in the world. Uh, when you think of hoven, like a great brand that makes one is Casa Dragonis. Casa Dragonis makes a hoven. Uh, I'm not saying it's a great hoven. I'm just saying they make a hoven and it's very well known. Um, and that hoven is a blend of extra niejo and blanco. So anytime you blend a blanco with something else, you're going to get a hoven. Um, it's not very popular in the tequila industry, at least what comes to our side of the border. So for the most part, you're going to have these four classifications. Blanco, Repo, Añejo, and Extra Añejo. Um, and these uh, come through the ages. They didn't all start there. It started with there is tequila, and then there is aged tequila. And then it started getting broken down into subclassifications based off of how old it was aged, um, all through the rules and regulations. Now, my friends, I know I'm running a little long, but I want to go ahead and try to finish. So we might run this presentation about like five to ten minutes over. Um, if that's too much for you, I'm so sorry. And you can always like jump off and rewatch the end later, but I'm going to try to keep going. Um, next, we're going to be moving into a process called rectification. After you age the tequila, you're going to be adding artificial ingredients to flavor it if you choose to. Uh, it's called the mellowing process. Sometimes the tequila in the barrels come inconsistent, so you're going to try to age it out and mellow it out to round out the flavor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play a little video here brought to you by uh, Tequila Matchmaker. Uh, tequila Matchmaker is one of our favorite partners in the industry. We don't, work, we don't work directly with them, but in the industry, they're huge for knowledge, education. They really try to spread the word of good tequila. And you can download their app, um, Tequila Matchmaker, and it shows you all the beautiful context of tequila. You can actually look up each individual type of tequila. Um, this is not a sponsorship, by the way. Um, and it shows you all the different details. We absolutely love it. You can look up tequila by the name, by the NOM, which is like the factory in which the tequila is made, and uh, also the classifications. So you can look at each individual type of tequila. It's absolutely beautiful app. Um, they do uh, professional ratings, and they also do um, like community ratings, where you can actually log on and type in your favorite types of preference, and you can actually keep a seller of all the tequila that you like. So that next time you want to try one, or next time you try a tequila, you can take notes on it right there on the app. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. And go check out Tequila Matchmaker. But here's their little video about additives. I hope this plays. Hey, this is Grover from TasteTequila.com and Tequila Matchmaker, and I think it's about time we had a little chat about additives. Most of the things we eat and drink contain additives. There's coloring and flavoring in pretty much everything that you can buy off the shelf, and tequila is no different. Now, not all tequilas contain additives, but often the ones that do can be pretty obvious. So let's talk about the rules, the types, and the amounts of additives that are allowed and what you can do to detect them. Now, no tequila brand in the history of the world has ever admitted to using additives in their products. And why should they? They're not legally required to do so unless the additives they put into their product exceed 1% by volume. Now this might sound like a good thing, but 1% is actually a massive number, especially considering that additive makers have been able to create stronger, more powerful, more concentrated products designed specifically for use in tequila. If a tequila maker does exceed 1%, the final product must then be labeled as a liqueur or a crema. So what about Blanco tequilas, right? Good question. In February of 2013, the Norma Oficial Mexicana, which are the official rules that all tequila makers must follow, banned the use of additives in Blanco tequilas. 
This means that all Blanco tequilas are supposed to be additive free. For all other tequilas, additives are permitted. Now there are four types of additives allowed by law for 100% agave non-Blanco tequilas. Let's go through the list. Number one is sugar-based syrup. Syrup or jarabe is a mixture of different ingredients used primarily for the purposes of creating a sweeter product. Agave nectar, corn syrup, cane sugar, aspartame, sucralose, which is Splenda, and stevia could all be used as a sweetening agent for tequila. The jarabe can also contain natural fruits and herbs to add aromas and flavors as well. Glycerin. Glycerin is a natural byproduct of fermentation and distillation, but additional glycerin can be added in order to create a more rounded mouthfeel. It is one of the more common additives used in tequila, and it makes a tequila that may be thin or watery feel fuller and thicker in your mouth. Three is oak extract. This adds aromas and flavors found in an oak barrel to the finished product. When using oak extracts, it's possible to make a tequila smell and taste as though it has been aged longer than it actually was. Number four, caramel color. This is used primarily for the purpose of adding color to the finished product. Caramel coloring has a mildly bitter taste and is used for aesthetic purposes. Additives are used at the end of the process and are generally meant for rectification, which means maintaining consistency between batches. But they can also be used to cover up mistakes or mask, mask deficiencies in the final product. Additives can be very difficult to detect when used in a subtle way. However, many producers tend to go overboard and build their flavor profile by relying heavily on the use of additives. These can become obvious because the aromas and flavors are very prominent and dominate or even take over the drinking experience. So, how can you tell if additives are in a tequila? Well, one telltale sign is if it is extremely sweet. Another sign is if it smells like cake batter, cotton candy, fake fruit, or tutti frutti candy. These are not aromas and flavors that naturally occur during the tequila making process. But the best way to teach yourself about additive free tequila is to become familiar with ones who don't use additives. Some excellent examples include tequilas made by brands like Fortaleza, Siembra Valles and Siembra Azul, Grand Ovejo, Alquimia, Don Fulano, Tequila Ocho, and Tiralta. And once you familiarize yourself with additive free products like these, the tequilas that base their profile around the use of additives will really stand out. And you can even, they can even seem odd or unnatural. Another telltale sign that additives may be in use is the use of a diffuser. If you don't know what a diffuser is, check out our other video and story titled Putting Diffuser Made Tequilas to the Blind Taste Test. I think you'll learn a lot. But diffuser made tequilas have an additional reliance on additives for two main reasons. First, they tend to use younger agaves that have not fully matured. And second, the aromas and flavors that come from the traditional cooking process that are not developed. As a result, diffusers produce a more neutral spirit, so additives are used to fill in the gaps created by the diffuser's production shortcuts. And our mobile app, Tequila Matchmaker, can tell you which tequilas are made using a diffuser, so definitely make use of this free resource. Now this is a tequila additive sample kit from one of the largest suppliers of additives for use in tequila. Additive makers like Bell Flavors and Fragrances and Simrise, among others, are able to replicate aromas and flavors in a very sophisticated way. As a test of just how capable these additives can be, we used samples like these to turn a Blanco tequila into an Añejo using just a toothpick by dipping it into the additive sample bottle and adding one drop at a time to a small glass of tequila, we were able to make it darker, sweeter, and smell and taste like a charred oak barrel within a few minutes. The result was a passable, aged tequila that could easily fool most experienced tequila drinkers. Now for the record, turning a Blanco into an aged product without it spending any time in a barrel is against the rules and we are not suggesting that any brands are actually doing this. 
but it just goes to show you how good these additives are. Some tequila makers will avoid additives entirely and stick to cooked agave, water, and yeast alone and let their process and terroir dictate their results. Others take a more active approach in manipulating their tequilas through the use of additives. This is legal and not necessarily bad, but for the tequila purists, it's worth learning the difference. If you're interested in learning even more about this, be sure to read our full story on our website at tastetequila.com where you can watch a candid conversation between Sergio Mendoza of Tequila Don Pulano and Clayton Check of Experience Tequila, all about additives. Thank you and salute. Now, I just want to plug really quick that tastetequila.com is one of my primary resources for tequila knowledge. They're absolutely fabulous. Um, and once again, they have the Tequila Matchmaker app, which makes tequila and the information and knowledge about it available at your fingertips. Um, they have absolutely wonderful articles and they're creating content all the time. Um, they're really on the ground in the industry and they are right in Mexico. So they go to the different distilleries, they talk to the different people, they're really hands on. So it's more of like an on the ground approach as to a broad concept approach. So if you really like the kind of like up to date kind of information on the tequila industry and want to see what's happening, uh, tastetequila.com is great and Tequila Matchmaker as well. Um, the articles are absolutely wonderfully written. Please, please, please go check them out. Um, please download their app. Uh, please check them out on YouTube. They've got great information, great products, great information. Once again, this is not a sponsorship. I'm just telling you one of the best resources that we have in the industry. All right, so back to our presentation. So after you add your additives, if you choose to do so, Hiatus Tequila adds zero additives whatsoever across the board. No additives whatsoever. 100% natural, beautiful, and clean as it is. Um, you go into the bottling process. And then the, the bottling process um, is very simple. They take the tequila and they fill it into bottles. Um, now the bottling has very few rules and regulations, but um, only 100%, so 100% agave tequila has to be bottled in Mexico. Um, the category of tequila can be exported. So places like Jose Cuervo and whatnot, they can actually have distilleries outside of Mexico, which are bottling tequila that's just tequila and not 100% de agave. Uh, but any 100% de agave tequila has to be bottled on site in Mexico. Um, the other thing is it has to be sanitary glass, um, able to be holding alcohol, which is called PET. And then um, you can't have large containers. Tequila is always small, sold in smaller batches, um, so no longer than uh, five liters in capacity uh, for transport and movement. Um, now, the reason that the tequila can be moved across borders is it's much easier to and more affordable to move liquid than it is to move glass. Um, so 100% de cave tequila tends to actually occur an extra charge just because we're having to move the glass bottles out of Mexico, across state lines, and into other countries where the 100% or the non 100% de agave tequila, just the tequila, can actually just move the liquid, which is much cheaper to order a truck and move the liquid and then bottle somewhere else. And that's why they chose to do so. Um, the last thing is that uh, on the label, there's some specific things you have to have. Um, and here's kind of like a quick little breakdown of the tequila label, just so you can read, because it's very important, just like wine, to learn how to read the label. Um, you want to know where it's made, what its na name is, and what it does. So here you have the, the mark name, which is the brand name. Um, you also have a batch number. So if there's anything ever wrong with the tequila, they can pull the documents and records and check and see what's going on and see if it's been tampered with. But also the batch number lets you know where the tequila, what the tequila was made, when it was made and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the brands that people tend to follow really closely is Fortaleza. And on the back, it'll say like number, like lot 46, which is their batch number, lot 46 uh, or lot 42 or lot 43, which is one of my favorite lots, wink, wink. Um, but it's that kind of context. Um, and then on the bottom, it'll tell you the category type, whether it's 100% de agave tequila or just tequila. So always check your label when you're buying tequila to see if it's 100% de agave or just tequila. There's nothing wrong with either. Feel free to buy one of each and put them side by side, but they are very different experiences. Um, and remember, the 100% de the non 100% de agave tequila only has to be 51%. It could be more, it could be, you know, but it could be just 51%. You never know what their blending ratio is and you'll probably never find out. It's their like hidden trade secret of how they make their flavor. Um, the one thing though that is very important on the label that you have to have is this little baby right here. This is the NOM number. This is the number of the factory in which the tequila was made. Now, the tequila industry is a little bit different. So unlike the scotch industry, where when you think of the scotch industry, you know, Glen, Glenfiddich has made at Glenfiddich. McAllen's made at McAllen. You know, all these different, Lefroy's made at Lefroy. So all these different places are made at their factory. Where in Mexico, it's a very regulated industry where the factories are actually licensed by the Mexican government to be able to produce tequila. So they are given a number when they get their per, uh, permission and approval. Um, and that number dictates what they are and who they do. This allows them to track what product's being made, where it's going, where it's moving, that kind of stuff. Um, the NOM for us is going to be 1137. 
And on the back of our bottle, you can see right there, it says NOM and then 1137 CRT. Um, on every single tequila bottle, they'll have that. Um, so if you really like a tequila, you can look at the back of the bottle, find out what the NOM is, and then go to the Tequila Matchmaker app, type in that NOM, and see what other products are coming out of that distillery. Now keep in mind, these distilleries are like big kitchens. There's lots of different methodologies to make things. Like our factory has a Tahona, but it also has, um, it also has uh, the screw, the screw um, mill. So it has different methodologies, and some will use one and one will use the other. Um, so it doesn't mean that all the tequila coming out of a factory will taste exactly the same. But for a good chance, there will be influence. So if you like a tequila like Clas Azul, like maybe go check out and see if there's another thing that's made in that distillery. Maybe there'll be a similar flavor profile at a better price point. Now, in the industry, there is also an issue with conscript brands uh, where they'll make a big batch of tequila and then they'll put a bunch of different people's label on the same batch of tequila. And so we don't do that. Very few people do that, but it is a thing where there are certain brands where it's literally the exact same tequila in a bottle with just a different label on it. Um, and you'll be able to tell and know. So it's the kind of thing where like we are made in a very specific way where we taste like nothing that comes out of us. Other brands that come out of 1137 are like Casanoble or Astral. Um, we taste like nothing like them. We are our own expression. We're made in our own unique way. Um, but once again, we're 100% agave with no additives and beautiful spree. Uh, we're also gluten-free and kosher. So it's a beautiful tequila and process. Um, but on the label, you'll always see like where it's made and what it does. So once again, if you're ever more interested in a certain product you like or a certain product you drink and you want to learn more about it, Either take the name or the nom to Tequila Matchmaker, and it'll give you all the detailed information, how it's milled, how it's processed. And as you can see in this presentation today, how you cook it adds flavor and changes flavor. How you mill it adds flavor and changes flavor. How you ferment it adds flavor, changes flavor. So every step of the process, these nine different boxes with this mix and match mentality can all change your process. So if you like a tequila that's made with an oven, maybe you go look at other oven tequilas and see if you'll find more that you like. Or if you don't like oven tequila and you only like autoclave tequila because you like that kind of one note citrusy sting, boom, go look at more autoclave tequilas and then you'll find other similar ones that kind of like fit in that mentality. So it's really cool to kind of see in the tequila industry where you can mix, match, and pair. So we learned about a lot of things. First thing we learned about is the different classes. There is 100% agave tequila and tequila and they are not the same thing. One is made with 100% sugar and one is only made with 51% of the agave. So it's the kind of thing where they're different, uh, different products. Um, one is much cheaper to make and tends to give you more of a hangover, uh, tends to be more stringent, meaning that it tends to have more of that sting and more of that like punch, that alcohol forward kind of nature to it, uh, very hot or heated. Um, the other is much smoother. It tends to have more depth of complexity, more flavor, more progression. That's the 100% agave. It's very beautiful, it's smooth, you can sip it. It has lots of notes and characteristics to it. And then in both categories, uh, or in both classes, then you have all the different categories where you have a Blanco, which a Blanco tequila either goes straight to bottle or is aged up to two months uh, in oak. Now, you can rest a Blanco, but if you rest a Blanco in stainless steel or anything else, it's not aging. It's just sitting there. So that doesn't really count in the classification. There are certain brands that will let it sit in a tank for three years. Okay, you let it sit in a tank for three years. You mellowed it out, you rested it off, some of the alcohol burned off, um, but it was not aged, so it's still a Blanco. You have a Reposado, which is a lightly rested tequila. Reposado meaning rested. Um, so Reposado is two months in oak up to a year. Um, it has to be oak. One rule in Mexico is it has to be oak. Just remember that only barrel rules. It has to be oak and the size. Um, then you have an Añejo, which goes from one year to three years. And then you have the extra Añejo or the ultra Añejo, which goes from three years plus. Now, for the most part, it's between three years to eight years is the, like the industry average. Um, there are some brands that go longer. Uh, one of the brands that does that is Fuente Seca. Uh, and Fuente Seca makes like some 15 year and some like crazy long years, like scotch aged tequila. Uh, but in the tequila industry, there's kind of like a concept where people really think that at that point, you've over-influenced the tequila with oak. And so, so you're not getting a lot of like the flavor of the agave anymore. You're getting more of the side effect of how agave affects with oak. And so you're getting a lot of the extra byproducts and flavors that way. Um, now, the other thing to remember in tequila is some tequilas use a lot of additives and some use none, like ours. So that's the other thing to kind of put in your head is when you're thinking of tequila, does it taste natural? Do you really taste agave or does it have one of those extra flavors? Is it very vanilla forward? Is it very pungent? Is it really dark for no reason? Does it have those like, like really sweet cotton candy kind of flavors to it? Does it taste like berries? These are all flavors that don't really exist in the tequila world. Um, but if they're there, it's because it's an additive. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But once again, every time you add something to the product, your body has to filter it out. So tequilas with additives take longer for your system to clear out. You have to process enzymes for each of those additives out of your system. And those additives, once again, can kind of get caught in your muscles and your bones. You can kind of get that muscle-achy, groggy feeling. 
because your body will try to read them as what they are and try to absorb them as opposed to doing toxic dump and getting them out of your body, like clean, pure tequila. All right, my friends. At this point, we've kind of hit the end of the presentation. I've gone over a little bit, I know. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit longer if that's okay with you. If you need to hop off, hop off. Once again, this will be listed live afterwards. Um, but I want to give you kind of like a brief history of tequila, just to, so you kind of understand where these rules and regulations came into place and like where in the time frame of the world did these different classifications come about. Um, I think it's really fun and interesting, but I just kind of want to like give you a little tidbit there. Uh, if you don't want it, like I said, you can feel free to hop off. Um, so a brief history of tequila. First thing you have to understand is that tequila is the ancestral beverage in Mexico. So the concept of tequila and mezcals and everything comes way back from the Aztecs when they were drinking pulque. Now pulque is a fermented beverage that comes out of the juice of agave. Um, they cut off the top of the plant and it kind of like puddles this like, like this kind of like fluid and then uh, that is fermented into what's called pulque. It's kind of like a beer fermentation. Um, so it's very lightly fermented. It's very low quality, um, not low quality in like flavor, but low quality in like alcohol by volume, very low ABV. Um, it's almost like a beer, pulque. And this was drank by the Aztecs for forever. Um, now, once the Spanish started coming into Mexico and started doing the conquistadors and taking over and stuff, they introduced also the concept of fermentation. Um, in a lot of books, there's a little bit of controversy here, whether the ancient civilizations also had the ability to do like mud distilling or if it only came when the Spaniards came, but we really don't know. But um, for sure, when the Spaniards came, they were missing brandy um, in this new world. So they decided to make stills and start fermenting this beverage that was already being drank, this pulque. And the fermented beverage became mezcal. Um, tequila is a form of mezcal, but mezcal is not tequila. There are different classifications and rules, um, but the overall category of all agave spirits is mezcal. It's the, um, the original Native American word for the agave spirits. So like mezcal de vino, the wines of mezcal. Tequila is one of the wines of mezcal. Um, so this is the old beverage system. Now, Moving into history after the Spaniards came, we had a long time where tequila was being made. In the 1700s and in the 1800s, tequila distillers really started opening up and popularizing tequila. Um, they also started like cross-trading with America. Now, granted, the time where tequila really became popular and really started growing and booming was the time of the prohibition in America. When America hit their prohibition, we only had bathtub gin and really bad vodka, and we were drinking these bad products. And then in about like 1933, uh, prohibition was coming to its end. Um, and at that point, we had already saturated our market with tequila, and we were drinking this new kind of found spirit. And the thing we loved about tequila, it being bootleg and so close to us, as opposed to the other products which had to be imported or made at home, is this, this product was clean. It was easy to drink. It didn't have all those crazy characteristics of like the bathtub gins that were being made, which were really dingy and dragy. And that's where the cocktailing industry really started coming from, is having that mask these horrible flavors, where tequila had this beautiful flavor to begin with. Now, all this being said, in the 1930s, um, is when it started becoming popular. And then about 1938 is one of the rough years in which uh, the margarita in theory was created. Um, and at this time, people were also taking vacations down to Tijuana and drinking tequila and coming back. There was a lot of travel, a lot of influence of the tequila industry. But now coming to this point, it wasn't until really uh, 1949 that the first rules about tequila in Mexico were starting to be made. So up to this point, tequila was being made. 100% um, agave and non-100% agave were really being pumped out at this point. Um, so tequila was being made. Um, 1949 is the first rule or regulation that was ever created in tequila. So you're thinking about the 40s now. So the 30s is when prohibition ended. Now we're moving into the 40s and 50s. Um, so right, right at that cusp of the 50s is uh, two, two classifications were made. There was natural tequila and then there was Añejo tequila. So there were a lot less classifications. It was either it is tequila and it's, it's young or there is tequila and it's old. And when you look at the Añejo at this point, it was a two year minimum as opposed to a one year minimum. So it was different rules and regulations in the 50s. And then we move into the 60s, and this is when tequila really started becoming more popular in America. In the 1960s is when it was really accredited that tequila's big boom happened in America, and it almost tripled the industry in Mexico. By almost a 300% ratio, uh, tequila started to be demanded and increased. And also coming through the 60s and the 70s is when like the big rock and roll bands, like the Rolling Stones, known as the tequila bands, who were like pumping tequila and like rocking out a concert, really boosted that industry. And so it really created this huge growth cycle for uh, like the tequila industry. And so people wanted tequila and demanding tequila. So Mexico had to apply with that. And this is when a lot of the regulations started happening to make sure that tequila was being made in the right way. So in the 1960s, um, the first amendment was made, which, add, which uh, gave them mixtures of sugar. So before this, tequila could be made with very little agave and a lot of sugar. Well, now they're starting to minimize that, being like, no, 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 tequila still needs to be tequila. So they start adding more rules. So this is uh, putting a 30% sugar from other sources, um, meaning that it still has to be a lot, a lot, a lot of agave. 
Now, obviously, we've rolled back on that. Now it only has to be 51% of agave, so it can be 49% sugars. But at that time, they were starting to put a box on it, as opposed to just being sugar with a little bit of agave. Um, it kind of rolling around and making it more like of a prominent category. In the 1968, uh, amendment started to really set the classifications. So that's when we started getting our Blanco, our Repo, and our Añejo, our young categories. Ultra Añejo and Extra Añejo are a really new thing. They're never really a part of the, like, the history of Mexico. Um, it was more something that we introduced with us and our want of bourbon and our want of scotch um, as like Americans and Europeans. And so as they saw that we were wanting these things, they decided to experiment and play with it. And then we started buying it. And now it's become one of the like ultra premium categories of tequila are these ultra and extra añejos, as well as like the Cristalinos and the extra weird added artifacts. Um, and then in the 70s uh, is when the true rule was set for tequila in the two types. So this is saying that there is type one and type two, 100% agave, and 49% sugar from other products as tequila. So it was only until the 70s that these laws were set. So it's really interesting to see when people think about these products that a lot of people think, oh, that's how it's always been. Well, it's not how it's always been. It was the influence of the world dynamic and the global like trade cycles that really set these kind of rules and regulations apart in a place and really influenced the industry as people were fighting to compete with being able to export their demand for the people. Um, and then in the 1976 is um, when the two categories were permanent and set. And then um, 1978 is where uh, the rules started to be placed. So the DGN is one of the government uh, bodies in Mexico, which sets rules and regulations. And they wanted to make sure that the standards started happening. And that's also when the Hoven class was created. So in the 1970s is when we first got our e export to Hoven. So if you look at this, 1976 is when the first categories for Blanco, Repo, and Yejo were created. But all the way back since 1950, we had Blanco and Añejo. So when you think of this, Hoven is one of the newer categories of tequila. And that might atone for some of the reason why it's not such a big market like share. But also at the same time, we have the demand for these more aged tequilas. So mixing these aged products with young products, at the same time, it might create a beautiful mellow kind of mid-tone. Um, at the same time, you're using your more expensive products to do so. So it's also a high demand and a price structure that kind of sets it out. So it's interesting to see that Hoven's kind of very young when you think of it, 1978. And you move into 1993, um, which is uh, when it comes into the, you start building the laws and regulations. And then it wasn't until 1997 that the uh, CRT was created, the Consejo de Regulatory de Tequila, which actually monitors and regulates all the tequila industry. And from 1977 up to until this point, it has become the most regulated industry in the world when it comes to spirits. The CRT actually has uh, GPS satellites which track the agave fields at any given point, And they can tell you how many agave are in plants to be moved into the tequila cycle at any time. Uh, tequila can't just be wild sourced and brought in. It has to be registered in certain plots of land with the Mexican government within the same year of planting to be able to be used. Um, and you have to have permission to be able to enter your tequila into the tequila market. So you can't just grow an agave randomly and then throw it into the market. It has to be known. And at this point, like this is the most regulated industry in the world. The CRT actually monitors the planting in the fields. They monitor the harvesting of the fields. They monitor the plants leaving the fields and entering the factories. They monitor the factories taking the agave off. They monitor every single step of the production process. And at the same time, they monitor all of the export tequila as well, including like the bills on landing and moving a product. Reason being is they're trying to prevent counterfeiting from a tequila and making sure that appellation of origin stays true. One of the big statements that appellation of origin, the first thing we talked about in this presentation was preventing the generic concept of a product. So preventing the generification of a product. They don't want tequila to become a commonplace thing. Tequila is something very specific and unique, and they want people to keep craving it, and they want to uphold the standards and integrity of that product. They don't want really bad products entering the market calling itself tequila, because if so, then all of a sudden tequila becomes something that's really sketchy and bad. Now, all the tequila that is in the market might not be the best, but at the same time, it was within the standards. So by no means is anything on the market called tequila that is legally called tequila with the stickers and everything on the back, bad tequila. It's just, it, it has a different range of levels of what people consider individually from our own perspective as good or bad. Um, so the CRT came around only in 1997. And that chart I showed you earlier goes from 95 until today. So it, it wasn't until like 1997 when the CRT really existed. Now, the last category and the newest category was only created in 2006, which is only a blink of way. Like it was not that long ago. Um, and that was the ultra Nijo category. Um, and this also allowed adding flavors. So there are flavored tequilas. Um, so now we have tequilas that taste like coconut, tequilas that taste like lime, other things, but they become their own classification. Um, but then at the same time, you also have this ultra añejo category that's born. And this has become one of the top selling categories in tequila. The ultra premium category of tequila is the fastest growing category 
in the past 10 years, and it continues to be so, it is the largest category. And a lot of these brands that are launching, um, which have kind of like a nickname in the industry called Disneyland brands, um, which meaning that there's just some famous person associated with it. Like we now have a Michael Jordan tequila and we have a Dwayne The Rock Johnson tequila and we have a Jonas Brothers tequila and we have George Clooney tequila and we have all these tequilas. Uh, and some people call them Disneyland brands just as a name saying that there's something famous associated with it. A lot of these brands that are entering the market are entering in the ultra premium like categories. They're entering in the extra Diego categories. Now some aren't, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he's got a whole spread. It sounds like a great product. I can't wait to try it. It'll be very interesting. Um, it's going to really revolutionize the industry. But the other products, some of them are hitting only these premium categories. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just It's upping the threshold of tequila. And we can already see that the price structure of tequila is starting to grow. So eventually, it might get to the point where, once again, like I said, tequila will be charging what tequila deserves. Once again, it could take up to nine years just to get an Añejo in your hand if there's no other like processes going into it. So it's the kind of thing where it's a very, very long cycle. We're talking scotch-aged products here, especially when you get into the Ultra Añejo category. And we're still selling them much cheaper than scotch. You know, you can get a $300 bottle of scotch or a $300 bottle of tequila, and the tequila could take a lot longer to produce. So once again, 2006, we started adding the last categories of tequila that we know, and now we get to the laws of today. So today, uh, in December 2012, was the last time that the amendments were made. The amendments were made only every couple of years, and they don't change the... the so like if you see here on NOM, it says NOM, six, uh, NOM 006 SCFI 2012. Um, it says 2012, and it will continue to until they change the law. Um, and they, it only comes up for a year, uh, for change every couple of years. And then if they don't change it, it stays the same. And 2012 is the last time they made amendments to the actual NOM, which affects tequila, which is the 006. And this is um, when everything was really set and specified and really entered into the market kind of as an educational tool for the rest of the world. This was the really like threshold that really like produced everything in a very like definitive way. So what this did, it was defined tequila, uh, that tequila had, that Blanco tequila has no additives whatsoever. Um, and it also added uh, the Ultra uh, Niejo class being allowed to be on the label. Prior to that, you could call it, it could be Ultra Niejo, it's just it wouldn't be on the label. Now it's required to be on the label. Um, it also prohibited um, some of the commercialization and the changing of machines and stuff. Um, it also said that you can't have tequila in like a big box machine distilling it. In France, sometimes in the like, center of a town, they'll have a machine where you can bring a bottle to and fill it with wine. Um, you can't do that in tequila. Tequila has very specific rules where you can't have big bulk things. Technically, having a machine dispensing large volumes of tequila is illegal. So if you have te like tequila on keg, um, technically that would be illegal. So any pre-batched cocktail with tequila that's pre-batched on a keg technically would be illegal. Um, but that's not, that's, I mean, that's a, a misdemeanor and some rules and regulation bending to go there. Um, it also registered agave for the same year. So this is the law in 2012, which says if you want to enter the agave industry and you want to sell agave to any agave farmer or agave producer as an agave farmer, you have to register the tequila with us the same year. So this is the year and the, like the rules in 2012 where everything really got shipped up, shaped up, boxed up, and really created those definitive boundary lines of what is tequila. It really set the Appalachian of origin into a new level of like proof and productivity of what tequila is. And it really clarified the industry. So when you read the NOM 006, it's very clearly laid out of what tequila is, what tequila isn't. Um, and there's a NOM for every single product. If you go back to the map that we had at the very beginning of this we had the tequila, the bacanora, the sotal, the raicilla, the charanda. Every single one of those has a nom. And every nom is very cleanly laid out of what it is. And tequila kind of like paved the path to building these very cleanly defined categories that are now protected by the Mexican law. And they're protected by other countries as well. They're in the NAFTA Free Trade Agreement as well as um, the World Trade Agreements. And other countries have registered trademarks or other like marks of um, origin. Uh, and it's been registered with the Mexican government to help being protected in other countries because they really want to prevent the generification of what is tequila and keep it proud and clean. In reality, if you want to call something tequila, you have to register it with the Mexican government and pay them every month to be able to do so. So if you want like a lip balm that has tequila on the label, you have to register it with the Mexican government and get approval to use the word tequila. You could use agave distillate or it has agave liquor in it, but you couldn't say that it has tequila in it unless the Mexican government approves. And so that's why a lot of the time you'll see these premixed beverages that come in like cans or stuff that'll be like, yeah, it's a margarita, but on it, it doesn't say anywhere on it that it has tequila in it. It'll say like liquor included or alcohol included, but it won't say tequila because they didn't register it with the Mexican government. Um, and there's even some great tequilas on the market that are tequilas that are no longer called tequilas because they didn't want to keep paying the CRT every month to be able to be a part of this like system. Now the CRT is great, offers a lot of things, protects a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of resources and advantages to being a part of it. But at the same time, there's a cost associated with it. Same thing with champagne in France. To be, to be called a champagne, it's not free. 
Um, and just because you grow, champ like, grow grapes in the Champagne region doesn't mean you can call it a Champagne. You have to follow the same rules and regulations, same kind of thing with tequila. It's a very specific and very like specialized. All right, my friends. So really quickly, we're going to go over the little uh, chart here on the left. Once again, we went over the different types of tequila. We have 100% agave tequila and tequila. And then we also have our different steps of production. We have the harvest. After the harvest, we have the hydrolysis. After the hydrolysis, then we go into the process of extraction where we extract the sugar. And then afterwards, we go into formulation where we decide what we're going to make. After we decide what we're going to make, we go into fermentation where we actually ferment the juices and turn it into, a t uh, into an alcoholic product. And then after fermentation, we go into distillation where we actually make the tequila. And then after the tequila is made, then we go into rectification, which is that one hidden step that I didn't really talk much about, um, which is adding the additives if you're going to do so. And then we go into aging. And aging is when it gets sit in barrel and becomes the different types of tequila, whether it be a Blanco, a Joven, a Reposado, an Añejo, or an Extra Añejo, which are all in the market today. Now, my friends, I want to thank you so much for participating and bearing with me. I know I went a little bit over here. I'm so sorry. I thought it would be a shorter presentation, but I really wanted to get that additive video in there because I think it's a great video and contextualizes a lot of things for a lot of people. Additives aren't necessarily bad. It's just another thing your body has to filter. And at hiatus, we try to keep our tequila as clean and pure as possible, being 100% the agave with no additives whatsoever and fully sustainable to make sure that it's a very clean resource that doesn't affect our environment, but an also beautiful product for us to drink and helps enhances the flavor, quality, and profile of the product. Now on that, my friends, thank you so much for watching our presentation, and thank you for bearing with me on this masterclass in tequila. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us at Hiatus Tequila on Instagram, uh, or you can also reach out to my personal Instagram account, which is Tequila Strong Clown, um, and we'd be glad to answer any questions, as well as you can email us at uh, ola at hiatustequila.com with any questions, comments, or concerns. Um, and please, if you liked this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, and click that bell icon to receive notifications of when we post and do live streams as well. And we're going to continue to do this all throughout quarantine, um, just to help lighten the mood. Um, every Friday, we're going to do a nice little presentation, another thing, and afterwards, all the presentations will be hosted on YouTube. So thank you, my friends, so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great day. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay well. Cheers, friends.